Building Healthy Organizations podcast. We understand how the human brain works and how that impacts behavior in the workplace. I'm glad you joined us today for our continued journey to understand how to build a healthy organization. Well, I've said before, and I'll say it again, it's the fourth quarter, it's time to plan for next year. What I've observed is that most organizations, and I've worked with hundreds of organizations over the years, don't do a real good job of reflection. They're okay at looking forward and where they want to go. Now, whether those are realistic or aspirational goals, that's a different discussion for a different day. But for today, I want to look at the planning process. How do we create a success pathway for ourselves, our organization, our leaders, our teams, and every individual in an organization? Well, it comes through planning. Now, planning is not just looking forward. It's also looking backward. What can we look at in the past that will help us in the future? And most organizations are good at the numbers side of this, but they're not real good at a lot of the other areas. The people trends that we've seen in the past, the turnover, the the training issues, the hiring issues, all of those things that have an impact on the bottom line, but are not really reflected on And I'm going to use that word reflection probably quite a bit today. Reflection is a very important part of a learning process. If we don't reflect on what worked, what didn't work, how can we change it, how can we adapt or innovate it, then it's really hard to grow. But there's another missing piece to this. Most organizations have some way of looking backwards in historical aspects of performance, numbers, the things that are related to how the organization has achieved its goals or not achieved its goals. People are really good at looking forward. Looking forward isn't that hard. Now, using the right process may be more difficult, but there's still something missing here. What about the present? What about today? The vast majority of organizations that I have worked with and observed do not do a present day assessment before they go into their planning process. So what happens is they're not really moving into that planning process with the best insights the best data, the best information they can gain. Now, what are those areas? Well, what about our organizational climate? What about our team climate, our team assessments? What about leadership assessment? And when I use the term assessments, I'm talking both actual assessments or surveys, but also just a very simple process of talking to people and connecting with people maybe going and doing a pre-planning interview with different parts of the organization, different people in the organization. That is an incredibly helpful process where you can open up some very good dialogue around what should change to help the organization improve, become better, achieve the goals next year that maybe we didn't achieve this year, or to build on our achievements from this year in next year. Well, let me share a story with you that I think illustrates this really well. I was recently working with a client on their strategic planning process for next year. Here's how the conversation went. Client, we need to do more leadership development. Me, what specifically do you want to do? Client, Most of our leaders are new and have not had much experience in management or in leadership. And so my response to that, what have you done to this point? And here's the client responding to me. Well, 
We've given them some guidelines in how to apply our mission and our values. They have a performance tracker that we use. The projects seem to run okay. Me. So you put in place some processes to support them. What have you done to help each of them grow and develop their skills as individuals? Client. Honestly, I'm not sure we even know where to start helping them develop as individuals. And my response to that, if you knew their preferred work style, their communication style, their different leadership competency capabilities, would that help? And the client, well, sure it would, but how do we get that? Well, this is where the conversation turn to assessments. And again, assessments being formal assessments, real psychometric measures, and like a, like a personality measure, a communication measure, a cognitive ability measure, uh, leadership competency measures, and those kinds of things. But it also can very simply be, in addition, having interviews, having discussions with people, around where they are right now, where they think they need to be next year. I read something recently that I thought was very helpful. And it talked about a contribution model of performance management, which is very simply having a conversation with someone around the strategic goals for the coming year and asking them how they think they can contribute to helping achieve those goals. That makes a lot of sense to me because that it's a form of accountability. It is a form of investment of that individual's effort and how much they're willing to engage. And it's also an agreement. They're talking about what they're willing to do And then the manager leader and the individual employee can have a discussion about, is that a good thing? Are we in the right direction here? Does that work for us? These are all things that add significant value and bring real clarity and focus to the planning process. You won't hear me call things strategic planning as much as you will hear me call them success pathways. And there's a reason for that. Success pathways are far more than a set of goals and objectives. They're a roadmap in how to get there. I've used the tools of psychology in business for more than 30 years. There's great power in using assessments when they're used correctly. Let me take a short sidestep here and talk about that. I talk to a lot of people and organizations who have their very favorite assessment. That's a big red flag to me. Using one assessment to make employment decisions is a door that you open to liability because most of the legal cases I've seen one around assessments, almost inevitably, it will be an organization using one assessment only and using it incorrectly. And there are many things that that you can do to overcome that, but I am a proponent of using multiple assessments to correlate different data points to give you the very best insight possible. Now, yes, I'm a certified assessment professional. At one point over the years, I've used hundreds of different types of assessments. I don't use that many today, but maybe a dozen uh, or maybe 18 different assessments, but using them in the right packages for the right purpose. So when I say power in using assessments, it is really there, but you're never going to get the full power out of that if you're not partnering with 
a certified assessment professional who's certified in multiple different types of assessments. You'll have a lot of people certified in one type of assessment. But if that's all there is, then are you getting the full picture? I would rather err on the side of caution uh, from an inside perspective using some additional tools to gain additional insights and then correlate that data to make sure that we're getting really good information that will give us good direction so we can make our very best decisions. So that's my, my little, uh, pardon me, sermon on how to use assessments. Let's go on and talk about, in the context of what I call planning, so that's strategy planning, people planning, all of that, assessments can provide insights and bring focus and clarity you cannot get in any other way. Let me explain what I mean by that. I have assessed leaders for years. In some organizations, we assess them every year, sometimes even more often than that, maybe twice a year. What's interesting is I can see changes in that leadership assessment for a specific individual over a period of time, which is also a good thing. You want to see the trend, the trajectory of that leader's growth and their growth in capacity, their growth in capability, their growth in acumen. You want to see those things happening. And it's a great way to track those things. But that's why it's important when you think about a planning process to ensure that you know where you are today. Where are your capacities and abilities and specific skills? How are those set up for what you're trying to accomplish in the future? And if there's gaps, then you can address the gaps through training, through development, through coaching. By the way, have you ever seen a professional athlete without at least one coach? No, none of them do that. Why? Because a coach brings out the very best in an individual. They're not there to do the work. They're there to help empower the individual to operate at their highest level to focus on the things that are important, to really develop themselves in a way where their trajectory maintains that upward movement. Let me ask a few questions here. If you consider one of your top performers, just think of a top performer that you know, do you know what makes them a top performer? Could you identify a development roadmap to turn other employees into being a top performer like this person. Thinking of your highest performing team, what makes them the highest performing team? Can you identify the characteristics that drive their performance? Do you have an idea of how to increase the performance of other teams? Do you have a way to identify potential leaders for the future? Do you have a hiring model that provides objective measures to ensure a better hiring process? These are all questions that can be answered through a well-designed and implemented assessment process. Even better, you can gain a competitive advantage in the marketplace by leveraging assessments for hiring, for development, for coaching purposes, and for our specific focus today creating success pathways for every person. We need to start with good data about where they are right now. How can you know how to help a person enhance their capabilities, enhance their capacity, their skills, their leadership abilities, if you don't know where they are right now? We're kind of shooting in the dark if, if we don't know those things. That's why I recommend considering an assessment process be put in place prior to 
what is probably one of the most critical planning processes you're going to do all year long. So think about how getting more insightful data and information would enhance your planning process. It really comes down to this. Better data, better insights will help you make better decisions. You wouldn't make a critical decision without getting the best possible information that's available to you. People are the most important asset that any organization has. So getting the best data possible enhances the decision-making process around people and planning for people development, uh, hiring new talent, all of the things that are going to impact the human capital side of your organization. The key to leveraging the power of assessments for planning, for development, for selection of talent is to choose the right mix of assessments that will give you the data that you need to make your best decisions. This is where a certified assessment professional like myself, certified in multiple types of assessments. And I want to stress that. It shouldn't just be, oh, we're certified in personality assessments. Well, that's great, but that's only one type of assessment. What about cognitive abilities? What about emotional intelligence? What about leadership skills? What about practical management skills? And you name it. I mean, there are all kinds of different types of assessments that could be added into that list. But those are some of the critical ones. Finding somebody that can bring that toolbox to you and really partner with you in your success in the planning process, in the development of your people, that is a competitive advantage that is unique. Let me share what I mean by how an assessment can help you in your planning. I'm looking at the assessment results for a client of mine who I recently did a team vital signs assessment on. Vital signs is a product of six seconds largest emotional intelligence organization in the world. Very tied in with them, very appreciative of the hard work that they put into these tools to really give you actionable data. And I stress those words, actionable data. You can get all kinds of data, but if you can't do anything with it, what good is it? So I'm looking at this report that has the drivers of success, trust, motivation, teamwork, execution, change, the ability to embrace change. And I'm looking at outcomes, sustainability, satisfaction, results, agility. The drivers will drive the outcomes. Well, that's the good news. Here's the bad news. This is not a very good report. And I don't, I don't want to, of course, I'm not going to share the name of the client. I'm not going to go into any of that. But the drivers are very low. The lowest driver they have is motivation. And right next to it is the ability to embrace change and, and work through change well. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. And it's impacting satisfaction negatively. It's impacting results negatively. It's impacting agility. It's impacting all of the outcomes in a negative fashion. When you look at a report like this, and I know that you can't look at it while you're listening to me, but there's also a measure of engagement. Engagement, the way I define engagement, is the emotional commitment somebody has to the effort, to the team, to the organization. How much are they willing to invest themselves? Are they fully invested or are they just getting by? And we're going to do a piece in the future on this quiet quitting thing that is going on where people are just doing enough to get by. 
a lot of the virtual and remote workplaces have really added to the potential for that to happen because people are not in the office setting anymore. Engagement is very important. What I'm looking at here, they have zero people engaged, 11% are neutral, and 89% are disengaged. What is disengaged? Actively moving away. This is a this is a really disturbing report for this team, a very concerning report. These are the kinds of things you can see. Now, not every team shows up at this very low level of measure, obviously, but it does give you very, very actionable data. If we know that change and motivation are the two lowest drivers, that's something you can plan to change in the year to come. This is how you can use an assessment like this to plan for the future. Uh, And you can cascade that down into the team itself and decide, do we have the right people in the right places? What do we need to change? This same assessment, by the way, is available for organizations. There's a 360 format for leaders, and that is a very powerful tool. Having peers, supervisors, others rate a leader and provide input to a leader. That is a powerful tool. So these types of tools, highly validated. We just saw a 15-year research study come out of this toolkit that is giving us some insights that are excellent for planning. And I highly recommend you go to the Six Seconds website. It's the number six seconds.org. And you look up Workplace Vitality Report 2022. Workplace Vitality Report. Download that. That is an eye opener. It is something that may very well change the way you plan for next year if you have a chance to look at that. So what kind of strategic insights can we pull out of this? And there's that word strategy. One of the most difficult things to plan for is people. But it doesn't have to be that way. If you use the right assessments in the right mix, here are the insights you can gain. Capacity, strengths and gaps, developmental opportunities, leadership potential, sales success potential, communication skills, cognitive aptitude, focus, energy, and engagement levels. These are all highly impactful measures, what I call actionable data, that you can leverage to enhance productivity and success in the future. Most people planning consists of putting in place some learning and development processes. We see it all all the time. We're going to do a half-day seminar. We're going to do a full day of training. We're going to send you to this conference. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. 70% of that is lost the minute that person walks out the door. So 70% is immediately lost. The retention rate overall long-term at best is 10 to 15 percent. So there needs to be a new and a different way to do development, training, and growth processes for leaders and for employees. And we know what that looks like. And we've developed courses and, and even a leadership academy that, that addresses a new way of learning, learning on the job using the job itself as part of the learning process. How do we do that? Our process is pretty simple but profound in its effectiveness. Assess, equip, align, and then succeed. That's the four-step process we use, and it's proven highly successful in empowering people to grow and learn new skills. 
we call it equipping people to prosper. Notice that that process starts with assess. Do you feel like you are in a place where you know everything you need to know about your people to plan and make your best decisions for next year or for the year after that? Probably not. I don't think any of us can comfortably say that unless we've gone through that process. Here's another question. Do you feel like you're the same as everybody else? Well, of course, the answer to that is no. We're all unique. We're all different. Well, that points to the need for understanding that that uniqueness is something we can leverage, but only if we know what it looks like. And the way we find out what it looks like is we assess. We put our people through a process that is good for them. It's good for us. It's good for everybody. And it really drives engagement levels. We've seen that happen in organization after organization. After that, we can put together a specific plan for growth and development to complement who we are uniquely. And that is the goal. That is the key to preparing for the future, planning for the future, knowing where we're going to go. Again, it isn't just a set of goals and objectives, which is what most people think of when they think of strategy. It is a roadmap in how to get there. And that's why we call it a success pathway. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Building Healthy Organizations by EQ Fit. We do understand how the human brain works and how that impacts behavior and performance in the workplace. We also love hearing your suggestions and ideas. If you have a topic you'd like us to cover, please send us an email at info at gscfit.com. For more information and inspiration, check us out on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and of course our website, eqfit.org.